Oh, I love the 80s. Fashion. A mullet, the hairstyle, is kind of the hair equivalent of the El Camino. <laughs> that is the greatest mullet of all time. What do you call that kind of hair? She used a whole bottle of white rain on that. It's almost like that shirt tuck thing that the high schoolers of the 90s tried to bring back. Neither of them worked out very well. Ric Flair! Woo! The rat tail is kind of like a mini mullet. The rat tail is, by name, something that is on a rat's butt. I tried to rock the mullet and the rat tail, but mine just curled up in the back. The rat tail is one of the funniest things I've ever seen on people. Heck, I had one when mine was a pigtail. Nowadays, the only place you can see the rat tail is at the jockey lot. Look, she's a beaut. You gotta be very careful though, because they'll bite you. Rats are gross. Keep them off of your head. I begged my mom for a rugby for Christmas. I begged her. And it made me itch so bad, I thought I had fleas. And plus, it just feels like you wearing a dog. <laughs> oh, the Jesus jumper. I don't know whether to look at you or to step on. It's like a burlap sack with a hole for your neck. In the 80s, you could pretty much wear anything as long as it covered you. Well, unless you were Madonna. And you could wear anything that wasn't covering you. Her accessories covered more surface area than her actual clothing. All you emo kids, you're a material girl deep down inside. I know you are. You know, the big cross necklaces over the bustier. So I think Madonna, if you're out there, the patrons and employees of the buckle owe you a debt of gratitude. So Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to go tonight. And if you're from a church background or an unchurched background, this is a somewhat familiar story. It's the story of the, the Good Samaritan. Um, while you're turning there, I've had a blast this week traveling to all the campuses. I've got to go to Greenville Monday night. I've got to go to Florence. What about that Emmett video? Was that not incredible? His story. I got to meet him Tuesday night, and uh, every once in a while, somebody will ask me, Perry, is video, are video campuses really working? And I'm like, I don't know. Ask Emmett. Um, I, think, I think it worked. I think it's working. Got to go to Charleston Wednesday and meet with a lot of people down there. Uh, over 60 people came to our lunch on, on 1230 on a Wednesday. It was great. Um, Thursday, we were here in Anderson. Over 4,000 people last week got trained on how to lead someone to Christ. And I'm um, looking forward to the fruit of that. And um, I, I, I was sick all day Friday and Saturday, and here I am tonight, and I'm ready to teach um, on this. Let me, let me start out by doing a quick survey tonight. Um, I, I, I almost said all of our campuses, but there's only one campus watching tonight. Eventually, hopefully, we're going to have other services in other campuses. Anyway, um, how many of you, we're going to do a, your favorite fast food restaurant survey. How many of you would say that you are like a Burger King kind of person. It's your favorite fast food. Okay, okay, so your way right away. That's good. I'm, I, listen, I'm down with that. I like, I like frame, flame broiled. That's, that's good stuff right there. Um, how many of you would say uh, Wendy's? You're a Wendy's type of person. Yeah, okay, a few, some Wendy's here. Arby's? Arby's? Whoa, curly fries. Yes, praise God for curly fries. Um, Hardee's. Any Hardee's people? Yeah, don't you love how Hardee's, like all these fast food restaurants are going healthy, 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 and Hardee's like, screw that, man. Here's a big burger. Um, <laughs> and some chicken fingers. They'll both kill you. What's that, a pork chop biscuit or something like that? Anyway, so they got Hardee's, um, Chick-fil-A? Whoa. Lots of Christians here. Uh, it's great. I like, I like Chick-fil-A. We'll talk more about them in a minute. Uh, McDonald's. Let me, let, me, let me talk to you about McDonald's. Let me, somebody over here said Sonic. Any Sonic? Son, I like Sonic. Great onion rings. Um, I like Taco Bell. We have, a, we have a prayer team. Good gosh, you're probably clean on the inside, aren't you? Anyway. I, uh, I'm, I grew up in Easley, and um, when I was around in... in in Easley, we only had one restaurant that had a playground in it. It was McDonald's. Now, today, a lot of fast food restaurants have gone the playground route, but in Easley, we had one. And it was completely unsafe. I mean, there's nails and, like, live animals and alligators and bolts hanging out. But, but it was cool. 
And the reason you went to McDonald's as a kid wasn't because you necessarily liked the food. It was like you liked the playground. And I'm not cracking on McDonald's food. If somebody's watching and you went to Hamburger University and all that stuff, and there really is a place called Hamburger University because I've had McDonald's people tell me all about it. They love to tell you about that stuff. But um, I, I didn't really love the food. I loved the playground. And so um, when I was seven, I wanted to have a birthday party at McDonald's. And so I went in and told my mom, she's like, what do you want to do this year for your birthday party? And it was like, the big dilemma in Easley was skater rink or McDonald's, on this because those are the only two things we had. And so I said, McDonald's. And so she goes down to McDonald's, she sets it up. And I, that, that year, I became a McDonald's fan. And here's why. I walked in to McDonald's that day, and I fell in love with the, I call her the McDonald's party girl, um, because she was hot. Um, she, she was like rocking that brown polyester and that visor with the, you know, golden arches right there. And she was like, hello, Perry, my name's Amy, and I'll be serving you today. And I was like, you will. And for the next hour and a half, she showed me so much attention. She was like bringing me cake, bringing me extra fries. We went out on the playground. We played together on the playground. I mean, it was unbelievable. And she, like through unbelievable service, made me feel like I was the most important person in the world. In fact, we, we left, and two weeks later, we're riding down 123 and easily, and um, my mom said, we need to swing by and get something to eat. I'm like, we're going to McDonald's. we got to go to McDonald's. Amy's at McDonald's. I hadn't seen Amy in two weeks. She probably thinks it's over. We swing into McDonald's. <laughs> Amy, I'm not even making this up. Amy's behind the cash register, and I, and I walked up to the cash register. She looked at me. She said, hello, Perry. I went, you love me. <laughs> and uh, that was the last time I saw her. But the point of the, point of the story is, McDonald's food, it's, it's great. I mean, it's good. I mean, it'll, it'll, unless you saw that movie, Super Size Me. But, I mean, it, it'll, it'll, get you, it'll get you where you need to go, I guess. But the bottom line is, I loved McDonald's, not necessarily because the food was good, but because one girl in that restaurant went out of her way to serve me. It's the same way with Chick-fil-A. Listen, listen, listen. I like their food. I think they've got really great food. But do you know why I really love Chick-fil-A? It, it's not necessarily the food, it's the service. They're unfreaking believable, aren't they? Like the drive-thru can be 18 miles long and you're through in three minutes. It's like, and they got their food and it's hanging out at the window in the bag and you get it and they go, hey, thank you for coming, ma. Any y'all work at Chick-fil-A? Somebody? That was, y'all have obviously been there. My pleasure. Now, here's, here's the crazy thing. Chick-fil-A is known for the way they serve people. Why in the church? Why is it, and listen to crack on Chick-fil-A, props to Chick-fil-A. This is more of an indictment in the church. In fact, the church in America is known for how we scream at people rather than how we serve them. And everybody knows what we're against, but nobody knows what we're for. Why is it that when it comes to really going all out and serving someone, we have to look in America at a fast food restaurant and not the house of God? So tonight, I just want to talk about that. Tonight, I want to talk about, we are in the middle of a series, our second week of a series, called I Love the 80s, which is really us kind of reshaping our core values as a church. Last week we talked about the value that found people find people. That you can't say you're a follower of Jesus if you don't actually have a concern for the people that Jesus had a concern for. This week we're going to start with core value number two. If you got your outlines, you want to write this down. Here's where we're going tonight. If you miss it, if you got to leave early or whatever, here's where we're going tonight. According to the scriptures, saved people serve people. According to the scriptures, saved people serve people. What are you trying to say, Perry? Let me tell you what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, let me stop real quick. I didn't say if you're an attender of church. There's a difference between somebody that attends church and somebody that follows Jesus. And I know a lot of people that have attended church for years but never truly followed Jesus. So I don't want you to fall into the trap tonight of thinking that just because I attend church, I follow Jesus. I'm talking about a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Someone who is completely sold out to God. Someone who has surrendered their life to him. Someone who is truly, according to the scriptures, saved. A saved person will naturally serve people. You can't help it. 
You don't even have to try to do it. It just naturally comes out of you. Save people, serve people. And it's found in the story of the, of the um, Good Samaritan. Now, here's, the con- here's where I'm going. You are called, you are gifted and called and equipped and empowered to serve Jesus through serving through his local church and outside the local church. We're going to go both routes tonight, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Let's pick it up in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Um, and, and, and this is the story. Let me, let me kind of set it up like this. Jesus had this incredible ministry. And um, I'm reading through the Bible this year. I try to do that once a year, and I'm in the Gospels right now. And one of the things that sticks out to me every time I read the Gospels is the number of people that follow Jesus around for the purpose of trying to trap him or trick him into saying something so they could run, blog, tweet, Facebook, or something about it and kind of get Jesus in a lot of trouble. Well, it got, they couldn't do it, and so actually the teachers and the Pharisees, of the, uh, the Pharisees went and hired professional lawyers to walk around behind Jesus and kind of catch him in a loophole. So that's, that's the context of this story, that people are trying to trap Jesus in something that he said. And verse 25 says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Which, that's ridiculous, testing Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, here's the frustrating thing about Jesus. He hardly ever answered a question that anybody asked him in the scriptures he just didn't answer he would always either a ask you a question back or b tell a story and people would be like what do you think about this and jesus would be like once upon a time there was a daddy bear mama bear baby bear and, and people are like crap answer the question jesus and he just wouldn't answer the question and in this right here we're about to see him ask a question back and tell a story so this he's just so Oh, he's just so smart. Here we go. Verse 26. This is Jesus' answer. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? In other words, what must I do to inherit eternal life, Jesus? Jesus is like, I don't know. What do you think? You're the lawyer. You're getting paid by the hour. What do you think? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now look at this. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Ding, 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 ding. We have a winner. We have a winner. But the guy pushes it a little bit. But he wanted to justify himself. Because we always want to justify ourselves before God. You know, we, we do that. We fall into that trap. So he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And this is where the fertilizer hit the fan. For this man and for every one of us here tonight and for those who might be watching online. In order to really wrap our minds around the fact that save people, serve people, we got to wrap our mind around two principles. Number one, we got to learn to see as Jesus sees. We've got to learn to see as Jesus sees. Because one of the things I'm learning in life is as you grow and as you mature in life, you see life a lot differently. For example, um, Karis, my three-year-old little girl, she, um, uh, several months ago, she got a bicycle. And you know, Lucretia was talking about a bike helmet. Now, let me kind of set up the context. I grew up on the Mill Hill, and we had a humongous hill in our neighborhood. It was big, and all the boys and girls would take their bikes to the top of this hill, and you rode down the hill. And somebody always crashed, and you would fall off the bike, and, and you skin your knee, and the mom would get out the back teen and spray it, and you'd scream like a Pentecostal, and then to be over with. I mean, it was, but it was horrible because like blood and stuff, and she's like, "This isn't gonna hurt," and then that was that was kind of it, and you just kind of that was part of life. So I we didn't have bike helmets growing up, and so I remember the first time I saw a kid with a bike helmet, I was like, "That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen." That kid needs to get beat up, probably, because that's like, why would you? Because listen, we grew up. If you're my age, I'm, I'm around 39. If you're a little older, maybe a little younger than me, we grew up in a completely unsafe era. Like today, we've got seat belts. Heck, my dad cut them out of the car. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, we don't need no stinking seat belts. I mean, he he cut those things. Out. One of the fun things to do. My dad had a big old Pontiac, and you would get up in the back window of that Pontiac and lay across the back window and he would slam on the brakes and you'd fly out of the back and you'd kind of land on the floor that was awesome <laughs> see we don't do that to our kids anymore which and we should not <laughs> much so anyway so i was like you know Karis, so lucretia comes to me she's like we got Karis's bicycle and we need to get her a bike helmet i'm like we're not getting her a bike helmet lucretia looked at me and said what i'm like lucretia 
It's a bicycle with training wheels, and she's going to be riding it in our driveway. She does not need a bike helmet. And she was like, Perry. I was like, Lucretia, I didn't have a bike helmet. She went, thank you very much. You just made my point. <laughs> so we got her a bike helmet. And it was, um, it was when, she, when the wife speaks, you got it, Donald? When she's speaking, you, you'll learn. All right, so anyway. I, uh, I, I, I just, I've changed my perspective. Now I put my seatbelt on. I remember when the seatbelt law first came out, I didn't like it, put the seatbelt on. My little girl, she's got a bike helmet. One of these days, if I ever get a bike, I'll get a bike helmet. And anyway, I, 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 it's, it's one of those things you change your perspective on. Well, let me tell you something about being a follower of Jesus Christ. Not an attender of church, a follower of Jesus. As you and I follow Jesus, he's going to change us for the rest of our lives. Like, if you're not changing, you're not following. You can't follow Jesus and stay the same. It's impossible. Anybody that followed Jesus in the scriptures consistently and constantly changed. And one of the things he does is he changes our viewpoint on life. He'll change the way we see things. He'll change the way we think about things. And if we're going to buy into the concept that is all over the scriptures that save people, serve people, then we're going to have to understand that we've got to learn to see as Jesus sees. And this is where we unpack this story. And let me tell you something about this parable. It's loaded. This parable is loaded. I'm going to try my best to get through it in the next three hours. Here we go. Verse, 20, or verse 30. In, in reply, Jesus said, a man was going down... Underline that phrase, going down. It's very important. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. All right, I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to explain this because this is huge. Because normally this is a sentence we read right over. But when Jesus mentioned two geographical locations, so it's worth our time to look at what Jesus was talking about. Jesus is talking about two places, Jerusalem and Jericho. Jerusalem and and Jericho. Now, a walk from Jerusalem to Jericho, took it was 17 miles long, but it was a 3,000-foot drop in elevation. Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, keep two things in mind about the cities that were mentioned. Jerusalem was the city of blessing. Jerusalem was the place that people went to commune with God. Jerusalem was the place that you went to have your sins atoned for. Jerusalem was the city ultimately where Jesus was crucified. Jerusalem was the, it was the city of blessing. Jericho, if you know the Old Testament, was not the city of blessing. It was the city of cursing. It was the first city that the Israelites took over when they came in. Remember, they marched around it, and they marched on the seventh day, marched around seven times, the walls fall down, they were all run in, and, and, and it was a, like a big old mess, and, and Joshua cursed the city and said, if anybody ever rebuilds this city, he will do so at the cost of his firstborn son, and if he sets up the gates, he will do so at the cost of his secondborn son. And sure enough, later on in Scripture, you actually see somebody decide to rebuild Jericho and his firstborn son died and he set up the gates and his secondborn son died, which some people push back and go, God shouldn't have done that. God's mean. Let me tell you something about God. If he tells you don't play in the road and then you go play in the road, who's stupid? You or God? You, okay, and me. i like, we're stupid. So, so Jerusalem was the city of blessing. Jericho was the city of cursing. This man, the Bible says, he began to walk from Jerusalem to Jericho. In other words, he walked away from the city of blessing, and he walked toward the city of cursing, which I want to stop and say, in a crowd this size, I will guarantee you that there's somebody in this room tonight that you've actually, in the past week or maybe even the past month, you started on your journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. You've decided to walk away from God. You are going down. Listen, nobody has ever improved the quality of their life by walking away from from Jesus, but there are plenty of people in this room that have, have the pain in their life to prove that they took that walk. Amen. There are people in this room, you, have, you, you are wrestling with the decision, do I walk away from Jesus? Do I walk away from what I know he wants me to do? And do I pursue that relationship? Or do I pursue that business deal? Or do I pursue that Facebook affair? I mean, do I go there? And let me show you in the scriptures what happens every time someone walks away from Jesus. Every time. Every time. Let's start that verse over, verse 30. 
In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. If you choose to walk away from Jesus, I'm not a prophet. I've just been in ministry for 20 years. That's going to happen to you. Jesus said in the Bible, in John chapter 10, verse 10, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. And when you walk away from Jesus, you are nothing but fresh meat to the enemy. And he has thousands of years of chewing up people like us that decide to walk away from Jesus. So if that's the path you're going down, listen, it's going to happen. And the only person, listen, the only person you're going to have to get mad at is you. Because the the wounds that you're going to experience are self-inflicted wounds. You chose to walk down that trail. I'm just being as honest with you as I know how to be. Every time somebody walks away from Jesus, they fall into the hands of the enemy. And the Bible says that this guy got the mess beat out of him, and he was left for half dead. In fact, when they left him on the side of the road, their hopes were the animals, the wild animals, would come and and finish this guy off. Now, here's the thing I know about every one of us in this room. If you have, some of us have walked down that trail. We know what it's like. But others of us, you've got friends and family members that this is their story. They walked away from God. They got the mess beat out of them. Spiritually, they're on the side of the road, naked, bleeding, and about to die. How do we help people like that? Let me tell you something about these people. A sermon or a song is probably not going to do it. Well, Perry, how do we help them? Let's keep reading. Glad you asked. Verse 31. We only got through like one verse. Y'all better listen quicker. Here we go. Verse 31. A priest... A priest. Let's talk about a priest for a minute. It's very important we see this. A priest had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Most of them had the Old Testament memorized. Memorized. A priest was what we would call in the church today a prayer warrior because he constantly communed with God. So the Bible says a priest It's very important to remember that. A priest happened to be going down that same road. Whoa, 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 whoa. A priest was walking from the city of blessing to the city of cursing. Isn't it funny that people can attend church every week and still be walking from the city of blessing to the city of cursing? The only difference is they walk that road with a Christian t-shirt on. Because they think that worshiping Jesus is all about the external and not the internal. Not understanding that Jesus isn't after our behavior. He's after our heart. Amen. Oh, there's stuff coming out tonight. I didn't say all morning. I don't even know where that, that was. That was good. I, I got two amens. And I'll amen myself because that was awesome. Jesus amen himself in Revelation 118. I'll amen myself because that was good. All right, here we go. Keep reading. Priest happened to be going down the same road. And when, underline this, he saw. He saw. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Now, it wasn't like, hey man, did you see that? It wasn't like he missed it. The Bible says he saw the man who had the mess beat out of him laying on the side of the road, and he chose to cross to the other side. And maybe he said something like, well, you know, he probably needs some prayer. I pray for, I pray for you, brother. You know, or one of those really great Christian phrases we say, but he chose to keep walking down the road. He saw the opportunity, but he walked by it. Why? I would say because he probably had to get to his Bible study or his prayer group, his accountability partners. Now, one of the things I get most quoted on all the time is that Perry does not believe in Bible study. That's the, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I study my Bible every day. I believe Christians should be involved in Bible study. A lot of people didn't know that New Spring actually started out of a college Bible study. It was one of the catalyst things that, that propelled the movement that started this church. But there's two different kinds of Bible study. Don't miss this. There's the Bible study that propels you to action, and then there's the Bible study that causes arrogance. And if you're involved in a Bible study that does nothing except brags about how much you know about stuff you probably really don't know a lot about, then that, listen, that's not becoming more like Jesus. That's becoming more like Satan who knows the word but does not apply it. Our Bible studies should propel us to action and not arrogance. 
and a bo- someone that's involved in a Bible study but can walk ra- right by a man who's had the mess beat out of him on, on the side of the road, I, I would say your, your, your problem is not that you don't know the word, it's that you don't apply it. So I'm all about Bible study. But Bible study should propel us to action and to know Christ more and more. The priest saw the opportunity and he missed it because he chose to walk by. Now there was somebody else involved in this story. There was a Levite. Levites were people that were kind of involved in a lot of church activities. That that would be our modern day equivalent. They were the people that attended everywhere but belonged to nowhere. Um, We'll talk about that in a minute. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, The Bible says this, verse 32. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him. (laughs) Saw him. It wasn't like, what is that? Like he saw the guy with a mess beat out of him. Saw him. Uh, where, where am I? Saw him pass by on the other side. Now, I'm a little confused as I read this story because the people that were most qualified to help this person, the priest and the Levite, chose to walk by. Now, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt in one aspect and say, maybe they saw the opportunity because they, they both saw the opportunity. Maybe they saw the opportunity and said, I just don't feel like I could do anything significant or contribute. Which we hear at New Spring Church all the time. We'll challenge people to get involved in ministry and begin to do something significant for the kingdom. And we have people push back on us and go, you, you just don't, I don't, can't really do anything significant. Listen, listen, I can't do this tonight. But if I could, if I could sit down with every person here for 10 minutes over a cup of coffee, regular, not decaf. And we could have a conversation. One of the things I would tell every one of you as I looked at you dead in the eye would say, if you are a Christian, you are called, you are equipped, you are empowered, and you are expected by Almighty God to get off of the bench and get in the game. You are way too valuable to sit on the sideline. Jesus did not pay the price that he paid for us so we could be trophies of grace and sit on his shelf. We'll have one day, we'll get to go to heaven and spend eternity with him, but while we're on this planet, there's a bigger purpose for our life, and it's not to show up at church every week and pat ourselves on the back and talk about how good we are. It's to serve a world that's had the mess beat out of them, and they're on the side of the road just needing somebody to come along and give them some help. We've got opportunities to serve every single week, day in and day out. So I would tell you that you can serve. You are called and equipped. Maybe he walked by and said, man, I need to call the church. There's a problem. Which is a myth here in the South that we've got those people at the church in the south you don't do anything about the problem you just call the church and they've got those people you know those people at the church those people because there's people that think we've got those people that live here like they live right above the auditorium and during the week we have big fire poles in here and so you call the church and the you know or the shine the bat signal or whatever and people freak out they start sliding down the poles they run and get in the batmobile They're at the hospital. They're at the grocery store. They'll come witness. They'll go everywhere. And then when they're done, they come back here to the church and wait on your call because there's those people at the church. You know what, church? You know what we got to realize tonight? You are those people at the church. We are the church. We've got to step up and be the church and serve the world. You are the church. Maybe they said, well, you know, that's a little out of my comfort zone. He has a mess beat out of him. I've had people say, well, you know, God would never ask me to do anything uncomfortable. The only problem with that is that he crucified Jesus. A God that would crucify his only son would be quick to ask every one of us to dive into the uncomfortable. We serve a God whose son got completely uncomfortable because we were that person on the side of the road that had the mess beat out of us. Don't talk to God about getting uncomfortable when he's like, I know all about it. It's called the cross. We want to chat? So I I, I love this because Jesus, Jesus does something in this story that's very unusual. 
He makes the most unlikely person in the story the hero of the story. Because he says this in the next verse. Look at this. But a Samaritan. Now, <laughs> when he said that, everybody's like, <gasps> because Jews and Samaritans hated one another. Samaritans were looked at among Jews as the scum of the earth. So he said, but a Samaritan, as, but, but a Samaritan as he traveled came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. In other words, when he saw the man, he was filled with compassion. You know why? He's the only guy in the story that actually saw as Jesus saw. And if we want to embrace the fact that saved people serve people, we're going to have to start looking at people not through the eyes of what can they do for me, but what am I called to do for them in order to usher them into the kingdom of God. Because saved people serve people. I love the fact that he's had to set a Samaritan. A Samaritan's about to be the hero of the story. You know, the Samaritan was the most unlikely person on the planet that anyone expected God to use in a significant way. And you might be pushing back tonight, and Perry, you go, Perry, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about serving. You're talking about getting involved in all this stuff. But you don't know me. I can't do anything. I'm not significant. I'm not important. I would say if you understand that truth, I'm not really significant, I'm not important, then you are nothing more than primed and ready for God to use you in an unbelievable way. Because when we look at the people that Jesus called to surround himself with, it was not the scribes, it was not the Pharisees, it was not the experts, it was the common, average, Ordinary, everyday people, the fishermen, the tax collectors, the zealots, the sinners. These are the people that Jesus used to turn the world upside down. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible says, it's talking about Peter and John, and the religious people are kind of looking at them. And the Bible says, when they looked at John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. Unschooled, ordinary men. That phrase in the Greek is idiotes. It's where we get our English word idiot from. Literally, the Bible is saying when they looked at Peter and John and realized they were idiots. And some of you are here tonight going, I'm an idiot. I'm glad you're an idiot. I'm the biggest idiot in the room. And God has a history of using idiots to turn the world upside down. If you're an idiot, you are completely usable by God tonight. I would praise God. I'll praise God I'm an idiot. And if you're an expert, you're the people that killed Jesus. <clears throat> we got to see as Jesus sees. Number two, we got to respond as Jesus leads. Um, there's an unpopular word in the English language today. It's called authority. We don't like it. <clears throat> Our parkers on every campus have to deal with it every week. If you're a parker, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're telling somebody to park right here. They're like, I don't want to park right there. I want to park right there. Well, it's one space. I know. Fine. Park. And then you, you flip our parkers off and all that good stuff. Don't flip our parkers off. And it's the people with Christian bump st bumper stickers that flip our parkers off. Anyway, um, and we take pictures of your license tag. Um, we don't do that. We should. We don't like authority. Like, how many of you have been pulled over by the police in the past year? Raise your hand. Now, come on now, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Got a lot of sinners here. That's awesome. Glad y'all. On your way to Chick fil A, weren't you? Because y'all love Chick fil A so much. Now, some of y'all didn't raise your hand because and you're, and, and, you're sitting beside your mom and dad, and they're going to find out. I mean, they, 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 they'll get that insurance bill in. <laughs> um, recently, I was on my way to a 4th of July celebration with some of my friends, and um, I thought the speed limit was 55. Now, if the speed limit's 55, you can easily go 61. Um, it says that in Second Hesitations somewhere. And so I was, tra it's not a real book, by the way. I was traveling down the road, and I was going 61 miles an hour. But I quickly discovered that I was actually in a 45-mile-an-hour zone, and I discovered that when I came around the corner, and there was a cop with a radar gun standing in the road, a motorcycle cop. He had his motorcycle parked over here, and he had a radar gun standing in the middle of the road, and he clocked me, and he just went. <laughs> I 
Now, i got to be honest, I wasn't happy. Nobody has ever seen a blue light or a cop in the middle of the road. Nobody's ever went, thank you, God. This authority is protecting me. You are awesome. Like, nobody's ever done that. So my first thought, I looked at him, I was like, I could hit him and keep going. I mean, I could do that. <laughs> but he had a partner with him, and so I didn't want to do that. He's probably watching tonight. Anyway, I, I was like, I don't want to do that. And so he, he, you know, I had to pull over. And Karis is in the back seat going, why he pull us over? Why are we stopping? I'm like, I don't know, baby. I think he knows me or something. Were you speeding? No, not daddy. And so i got to have that conversation. Anyway. So he, I, I had to pull over and respond to his authority. Now, there's a reason I didn't gun it. He had authority. And it, the authority was the uniform that he was wearing. And because of the authority that he had, I realized that I had to do what he was telling me to do. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is simply responding to his authority. And if we're not responding to his authority, we're not doing what he tells us to do, then once again, we're not following. We're just showing up to church. I want you to follow Jesus, and here's what I believe he's doing tonight. Here's what I believe he's going to do with a lot of people. He's got his radar gun, he's standing in the middle of the road, and he's telling you to pull over because he wants to have a chat with you about save people, serve people. See, here's the deal about this church. I don't want an audience. I want an army. I don't want spectators. I want participators. The most annoying people are on the planet is the fat guy in the stands with a hot dog screaming at the athlete how he should perform when the athlete's actually playing the game. And we've got some people here that play the game well. And then we've got some spectators. And we've got, we got to move on from that. Come on, because nobody's ever... I've never seen an athlete that stopped and said, Hold on, coach. That guy with the hot dog? I think he's got it going on. He read a football book once, and he plays PS3. I'm going to go hang out with him. Oh, i got to move. Here we go. Verse 34. He went to him. See, that's good. See, that's good. Because when you see as Jesus sees and you respond as Jesus leads, the guy, the Samaritan that saw the opportunity, went to him. If we want to be like Jesus, we've got to go to him. You know why? We've got to go to the guy that's wounded. We've got to go, got to go to the guy on the side of the road. You know why? Because he came to us. We were that guy. I was the guy on the side of the road. I was the guy that had the mess beat out of me by the world. And Jesus, in his grace and his mercy, came to me and got his hands dirty. I'm glad tonight that I serve a God that got his hands dirty. I'm glad I serve a God that didn't come to me and preach to me, but rather scoop me up and pulled me out of the situation that I was in and if we're going to be like Jesus we've got to learn to go to them he came to me he came to me man that pumps me up because he came to me if you're gonna clap clap don't play around with it tonight some of you can't get excited about that you know why you didn't realize what he did for you or either he hasn't done it for you yet. Just think about that. I've had people push back on church shouldn't be an exciting place. The tomb is freaking empty. Amen. That's a lot better than touchdown. <laughs> All right, so here we go. He went to him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. That's important. We'll hit that. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. In other words, there was an offering involved. Don't miss that. It's good. We'll come back to that. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. This guy was involved three ways in this dude's life. Let me just say this. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're called to be involved in a local church. The three ways I'm about to share are the three ways that you are supposed to be involved. You're not supposed to be involved one of the three ways or two of the three ways, but all three ways. Let me say this also. If you're not involved in a local church, there's at least 30 New Testament commands that you aren't fulfilling. 
you're, you're, you're not fulfilling. So you and I are called to be, called to be involved through service in the context in and through a local church. How do we do that? There's three types of involvement. Letter A, spiritual involvement. Bless you. Was that a sneeze? Holy cow. That was either a sneeze or there's a mouse over in that corner and we need to get it out of here right now. Spiritual involvement. We're putting this on the podcast too. Spiritual involvement. Now, here's what, here's what I find significant about the Samaritan. He went to the guy on the side of the road, and he used two things. He used oil and wine. Oil is significant of the Holy Spirit. Anytime you see oil used, it was usually used to symbolize the Holy Spirit. Wine was used to symbolize the blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, there were some spiritual implications in the way that the Samaritan was helping the man on the side of the road. And you and I, in the context of the local church, we're called to be involved spiritually. You and I, and, and some people are good at that. Some people are good. And, and, and some of you might be asking tonight, how can I be involved spiritually? Well, it's very simple. Pray for your church. Pray for your church. Pray often for your church. Pray hard for your church. Pray big prayers for your church. Oh, my gosh. In, in the, let me tell you how to pray for this church. In the first 10 years, we reached 10,000 people for Christ. By the time 2020 comes around, we want to go from 10,000 to 100,000. Let's pray that prayer. Let's pray that prayer for our church. And I, I, I've, I've had people look at me like I'm smoking crack all day when I say that. Listen, people have been telling me I was crazy for 10 years. I am crazy. I'm crazy enough to believe that if he did it in here, he can do it in here. He's the same God. That's what I'm praying for. In fact... I heard this scripture this week, and I just want to share it to you. I didn't share it in any of the other services this morning, but Isaiah chapter 62, it's not going to pop up on the screen. You're going to have to listen to me. Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7, Isaiah said this. I have posted, or wrote this. I have posted watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They will never be silent uh, day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourself no rest and give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Let's give God no rest. Let's wear him out as a church. Let's beg him to save souls. Let's beg him to transform communities. Let's beg him to change lives. I want a church that knows how to pray big. God is capable of doing more than paving a parking lot and sending secondhand clothes off to some foreign country. We serve a God that can still do this right here let's pray like you can I listen I'll say this unashamedly I've been doing this gig for 10 years pray for me I'm your pastor pray for me I need your prayers I got a text the other night from a guy that said I, my family and I pray for you every single night by name I was like man it's greater than getting a million dollars I don't know about that <laughs> some of y'all want to test that theory try it out tonight God will bless you for it. Anyway, I, uh, I, I really did. He really did send me that text in the middle of the night. Pray for me. Pray for me. I mean, the pastors go through a lot. You, pray for my wife. Most underappreciated person in any church in America, pastor's wife. Hands down. She, I mean, she got to put up with me. Pray for Karis. Pray for my little girl. You know about preacher's kids. God help us. <laughs> Be spiritually involved. Pray for your youth pastor. Those of you here at the Anderson campus, you should pray for Brad. You should pray for the children's ministry. You should pray for Lee, our worship leader here at the Anderson campus. You should pray for John McDermott, our can campus pastor. Well, how can I pray for them, Perry? I don't know. Why don't you ask them? They'd be glad to tell you. I ain't never met anybody that got offended. How can I pray for you? You shouldn't ask that. I've never met anybody that got offended. <laughs> spiritual involvement. Let her be physical involvement. Now, this is fun right here. This is awesome. Physical involvement. The dude, the Samaritan, walks up to the guy that had been beaten to a bloody pulp, and he had to put him on his donkey. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this. If you've ever had to move someone, and you call it dead weight, it's not like they're helping you. It's not like, let me help you up. It's like they can't move. And you've got to get your hands under them and scoop them up and physically carry them to the donkey. 
and put them on your donkey if, if you have a donkey, but you got to scoop them up and put them on the donkey. Let me tell you something. He got his hands dirty, he broke a sweat, and it was tough. God's called every one of us in this room to get our hands dirty, break a sweat, and do something tough for the kingdom. Every single one of us. Nobody gets a star because we sat in a chair. God has called us to get our hands dirty because we serve a Savior who got his hands dirty to reach us. Every one of us are called. Now, in a church like this, every once in a while, we get people to come in and they want to tell us how gifted they are. Well, I'm gifted. I'm gifted. I'm gifted in this area. I'm gifted in this area. Let me tell you something. If you're gifted then shut up, because we'll figure it out. Does LeBron James have to tell people he's gifted at basketball? Seriously. Does LeBron have to walk onto a basketball court and go, I'm gifted, y'all should let me play. Y'all, give me that ball, I'm gifted. You know how you know LeBron's gifted? Because he shuts up and plays the game. That's how you can tell somebody's gifted. Did Jimi Hendrix have to tell people he could play a guitar? Did Jimi Hendrix have to say, guys, I'm gifted at playing the guitar? No, he got a guitar in his hand, and he shredded the crap out of it, and people were like, I think that guy might can play a guitar. And then he set it on fire, and I hadn't figured that out yet. But anyway, he... I mean, he the Samaritan didn't say, I'm gifted. He served, and his gift was discovered, not through his bragging, but through his action. If you're gifted, shut up and serve and people will see it because somebody that has to listen somebody that has to tell you that you're gifted you know what i've discovered about them that's not their gift i've had people come up to me and go i got the gift of healing well let's go to the hospital <laughs> let's clear that thing out <laughs> if you've got a gift you don't have to brag about it you just do it and it will be discovered and let me tell every person in this room that you're called not to attend, but be involved physically in a local church. You heard me say it two weeks ago, and I'll say it again. It's crazy in the church today that everybody wants to hop from church to church to church to church. We want to attend everywhere but belong nowhere. And you know what you call somebody that does that on a consistent basis and relationship-wise? You call them a hoe. <laughs> and tonight we got some spiritual hoes in the house. Because you hop to church to church, but you ain't dedicated to anything or anyone. You are a spiritual hoe. Get committed. Get your hands dirty. We've had people do that here at New Spring from the beginning, got their hands dirty. When we used to meet in the Fine Arts Center, we had people that would show up at 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning. You know what? They didn't pray the equipment into place. They didn't get down next to the trailer and go, oh, dear God, we're just believing you for a miracle today. And as they began to pray, angels descended from heaven and began to set up our sound equipment. We've had people get their hands dirty. We'll have people get their hands dirty tonight and direct traffic out of the parking lot. Right now, we've got people getting their hands dirty with your babies changing some diapers. We've got, we've got volunteers that come in about every week or every other week and watch wipe down every one of our children's toys in the children's area. They get their hands dirty. And the reason this church is growing and people's lives are being changed is there are hundreds, even thousands of people in this church that have said, sign me up, I'll get my hands dirty. And God is using you. But listen, not only is God using you, but you are growing in ways that you never thought you would ever grow. Because some people look around at this church and they go, this church doesn't need me to serve. This church not, might not need you. Because, yeah, we'll get it done. We'll be fine. But you need the local church to help you develop your gift. I'll unapologetically say that because in the scriptures, Jesus says, you are equipped to be a part of the body. What is the body? His church. You're called to serve. In the church and through the church. And in a couple weeks... John McDermott will come out, and we were going to co-teach something together on what this campus is going to do. We're going we're to unleash a service day in this community that's going to blow this community's mind the way this church gets outside these walls and serves people. Amen. So show up for that one. It's going to be fun. The last one is financial involvement. <laughs> now, listen, I'm not after your money. We already took the offering. 
It happens in a mega church. You knew it was coming, didn't you? Hold on to your wallet, Marge. Anyway, um, we're not. Listen, we already right, took the offering. But I'm telling you, listen, 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 listen. He gave. Don't miss this. The Samaritan gave two coins. Where did he give them? He gave them to the house. He gave them to the house. He didn't run down the road and give them to another ministry because he thought that house was okay. He gave them to the house. You're called, if you're involved in a local church, you're called to bring your tithe to the house. Now, some of you are like, I'm a college student. 10% of nothing's nothing. We got it. All right? But for the rest of us, the money's called to come to the house. I make no apologies for that. It's not the church needs your money. It's that you and I need to be obedient to the basic commandments of God and bring the money to the house. I'll use this analogy. I've used it in Anderson before, but I want to use it one more time just to kind of illustrate it really beautifully because this happens from time to time. Let's say tonight you decide to leave and you're going to go to Outback to get a dinner. Some of you probably are now that I'm planting this in your mind. I would love to go. And let's say you, you're and you buy. I'm going, we're going to Outback tonight, and we're going to get the, we're going to get the cheese fries and the blooming onion. Like, we're not even playing around. Like, like seriously, I quit school because they have recess. I don't play. We're going to get the cheese fries, all 160 fat grams, and the blooming onion, all 210 fat grams, and we are going to literally try our best to have a heart attack right there at the table. And then we're going to get a salad because the salad cancels all that out. And then we're getting a filet cooked medium or medium rare because if you're going to cook well done, you might as well eat your shoe. And then we're going to get some of that bread. And some of you ladies are putting that bread in your purse and you're getting extra bread and you're taking it out of Outback. And I'm ashamed of y'all. Bring somebody to church. And so after that, we're going to finish it off with a chocolate thunder from down under. And, and, then, and then as we're celebrating, the manager's going to bring out our bill. How crazy would it be for us to get up and shake his hand and walk out and not pay? And he say, hey, hey, where are you going? And you go, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to go pay at Cracker Barrel. I mean, y'all look like y'all fine in here. Y'all just remodeled. And my family's always gone to Cracker Barrel. And I grew up going to Cracker Barrel. And I know it's a yard sale where a restaurant broke out. <laughs> and it just looks like they need my money down there a little bit more. You know what the manager of Outback would say to you? Where did you eat? Where did you get fed? Now, somebody might push back tonight and go, well, I'm not getting fed here. I would invite you to find a church where you do get fed. I understand that. That's fine. There's no sweat off my back. But you're called to be involved in a church spiritually, physically, and financially. The money went to the house. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. We'll talk about that later on. I'm not going to tell you when, though. You might not come back. Verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and be like the idiot who thought he was unusable and realized that God could use him to do great things. You know how I got started in the church? I didn't show up at the church and say, I think I can preach. Give me a Bible. I literally received Christ at Brushy Creek Baptist Church in Easley, South Carolina on May 27th, 1990. And on May 28th, I was volunteering for Vacation Bible School. I was like, I'll do anything here. I just want to be involved. And through a process, before I knew it, within a month, I was speaking to the youth group. And before I, within a year, I was working in a church. It was unbelievable. But it didn't get started by me getting up and, and just announcing how gifted I was. And listen... When we serve people, like Jesus served people, it's a game changer. I'll close with this. I, uh, right when I graduated college, I moved into a one-bedroom apartment with my dad. It's all we could afford. I think it was like, I don't even remember how much it was, but I let him sleep in the bedroom. I slept in the floor in the living room. That's where we lived. And there was this couple in my apartment. There was this one particular dude, and I didn't like him. 
um, I didn't really have a reason, uh, probably because I was sinful, superficial, and shallow. I just didn't like him. Like, he's one of those guys that you can't really explain it, but when you see him, you're like, I don't like that guy. Why? I don't know. I mean, look at him. I don't even like him. He always smiled. I don't like people that always smile, you know. I do now, but I didn't then because I didn't understand. And so I was like, I don't, I don't even like this guy. And then, and then he'd walk by me and be like, hey, Perry, how are you doing? I was like, fine, man. How you doing? I will cut you. Anyway, so I kind of had that <laughs> attitude. And, um, and it's, it's funny how God will humble you in a situation like that. I pulled up one day in my car and um, I got out, and when men are doing something, and sometimes we don't know what to say to them, we will state the obvious and look stupid. Like, we'll walk, in, we'll walk up to a guy that's mowing his grass, and we don't know what to say. We're like, hey, man, mowing your grass? Nope. Here's your sign. So anyway, that's, I was kind of in that. So he was under his car hood, and I didn't like him anyway. He's under his car hood, and I thought about going, Ka-da-da! you know, kind of walking on, but I didn't. Um, and he's under his car hood, and I was like, hey, man, working on your car? And he was like, yeah, I'm just cleaning my battery cables. And I just said this right out. I was like, I was like man, I was looking at my battery cables the other day. I need to get those things clean. And he was like, he, he raised up out from under his hood and said, I'll clean them for you. And I'm like, no, nah, man, I ain't going to let you clean. He, he looked at me and said, Perry, seriously, I would love to clean your battery cables. So I popped the hood, and he got under my car hood, and he's sitting there cleaning my battery cables, and the Holy Spirit the whole time is whispering to me, going, jerk. <laughs> you rear end. I mean, he, I mean, I was like, oh, my gosh. You know what? On that day, my attitude toward this guy completely changed. And I realized he wasn't the one with the problem. I was. And it's not because he sent me a verse, and it's not because he sang me a song, and it's not because he preached me a sermon. It's he served me. If we'll step outside these walls and become the servants that Jesus called us to be, it will change this world. We're called to step up and serve. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for today. For your grace and your mercy. Here's the invitation. It's a little different tonight. First of all, if you're here tonight and you don't know Christ, as you leave right outside these walls, right outside those back doors, there's a guest services desk. I would love for you to stop by there. Tell them, hey, I want to know more about a relationship with Jesus. Or if you just have any basic questions about the sermon tonight. You stop by there and somebody would love to meet with you, pray with you, chat with you. But for the rest of us, here's the invitation. Get out your bulletin. And in your bulletin, just do it right now. You can open your eyes. You can't do this with your head bowed and eyes closed. I know it's hard. Get out your bulletin. In your bulletin, you got a little card that looks like this. I want you to look at it. It's a little card that looks like this at the top. It says, I want to be an owner and will attend ownership class. We don't have membership class. We have an ownership class because members have rights, but owners have what? Responsibilities. Some of you have been coming to New Spring for a long time. You ain't never attended an ownership class. God's called you to be involved in this church. You check right there. And we've got this live going on in Anderson tomorrow night. I'm teaching it. For those of you that have been through the ownership class before, it's brand new material. I mean, the vision hasn't changed, but some of the content has changed. If you'd love to swing by, you can. You can just put your name. But what we're asking everybody to do is check. And if you can't go there, they got one in Greenville on Thursday night. You put your name, you put your phone number, how many people you'll be bringing with you, including children, first and last names and the ages of your kids. You sign up. We're going to have a packed house tomorrow night. I can't wait. You sign up right now. This is the invitation. But for the rest of us, and let me just say this, I made this announcement this morning, so our campus has just found out about this today. I didn't tell anybody till today because God didn't tell me till this morning. But at the bottom, there's a thing that says, I'm already an owner. I mean, you've already gone through a membership class and you've already signed the covenant. I don't volunteer, but I'm ready to serve. Please fill out your info below, your name and your phone number. And just get involved. I want everybody to listen to me. I say this unapologetically. If you've gone through a class, but you're not actively serving in ministry, I love you and I'm glad you're here tonight. 
but you're a liar because you signed the covenant that said you would. So what we're doing with all of our current members is we're giving them till December to get involved. And then if you, in December, we're purging the membership roles of all people that are not active in ministry. You can attend New Spring, but you can't call yourself a member anymore because we're purging the roles. This, listen, and I'm not being mean. All I'm doing is allowing you to not lie to Jesus anymore. Because the book of Ecclesiastes says it's better to have never made a vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. I'm just asking you to do what you said you would do and step up. Because listen, if you don't do it, the church will be fine. But you will never become the person that Jesus has called you to be. You will never develop until he, until he wants you to be because saved people serve people. So you fill it out and let's get involved. Because listen, we've got a city to reach. We've got a gospel to preach. We've got a world to change. And found people, find people. Save people, serve people. So church, let's get busy doing all we can. I love you. Thank you for being here tonight. And I'll see you next week. God bless.